RC from the Montauk Joiner Shop here. I'm about to do all kinds of rabbiting in my shop, and my weapon of choice for that operation is this little beauty here. This is the Veritas Skew Rabbit Plane. It's a pretty good plane. Uh, there are a few things about it, however, that uh, I don't love so much, and I've had to find workarounds for those things. So I'm going to share some of those workarounds with you. I'm going to talk about what it's like to uh, do a lot of rabbiting with this plane. So I'll share some tips about that as well. And I think I'm finally gonna make a little auxiliary fence to go on this plane as well. So there's a lot to do in this video. Stick around. Before I get into the ins and outs of actually using this plane, I thought it'd be a good idea to go over some of its specs. So this is the Veritas Skew Rabbit plane, as I explained earlier. And as the name implies, it has a skew blade. The blade's skewed at about 30 degrees. It's an eighth of an inch thick. And it's bedded at about 45 degrees. The blade width is about an inch and a half. And the fence rods that come with the plane are long enough to accommodate the full width of that blade. Although there are longer fence rods available. I'm not sure what they're for. But I don't know why you would need them, but they do exist. And on the other side of the plane here, we have a depth stop that will allow you to uh, control your depth up to about three quarters of an inch and you can see there's a couple set screws here as well those control the angle that the blade is cutting at the plane is available with three different types of tool steel for the blade a2 which is what this one is o1 and veritas own pmv 11 steel if you get this plane in a pmv 11 steel blade it will retail for about 285 dollars us which is quite a bit more than I paid for this plane way back in the day when I got this one. And it's also available in right and left-handed versions, though with the uh, blade being skewed the way it is, I find it not really necessary to own both versions, but I suppose if you wanted to splurge a little bit, you could accommodate the grain direction on a given rabbit uh, much more easily if you had both the right and left-handed versions. But being right-handed myself, uh, this is the only one I've ever had, and it gets me by just fine. One of the last features I'd like to talk about on this plane is this little kind of wheel gauge style knicker under here. And you can adjust that knicker up and down. That said, it is very, very, very finicky trying to get it to line up with the outside edge of the blade. So basically, uh, when you set up this plane, let me turn it this way a little bit. When you set up this plane, you want the very corner of this blade to project out the side of the plane just a little bit. And in so doing, uh, you need the knicker to line up with the outside corner of that blade. And there's really, to the best of my knowledge, no good way to do that. In trying to get the knicker lined up with the blade, uh, early on when using this plane, I wrecked all kinds of rabbits, man. There's all kinds of tear out. It's just an ugly, ugly mess and a huge pain in the butt. So I eventually ended up giving up on this little knicker and have found other ways to use the plane that don't require the knicker. And some of them are pretty easy and straightforward. Others are a little bit extra work, but in uh, my book, yield a better result in the long run and, and may be well worth it to you as well. Like I mentioned earlier in the video, I think I'm gonna put an auxiliary fence on this uh, skew rabbit plane fence. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull it off here and show you that it is in fact drilled at each end for a screw that will allow you to mount a wooden fence to it. And the reason you would want to do that is twofold. One is you can make a much taller fence. So, you know, this is a pretty narrow piece of sapile right here, but you can make a, a fence that's, you know, an inch and a half, two inches tall if you want. And that will allow you to hold the plane. Oops, put that on there a little bit better. It'll allow you to hold the plane uh, a little bit more uh, square to the rabbit that you're trying to cut. For me, I don't really feel like I need a fence so tall. The main reason I want to put a fence on here is if you've ever used a wooden bodied plane or anything that's got a wooden sole on it, basically, you will know that it slides so much more easily on the wood and doesn't have to be waxed all the time. So rather than having to wax this uh, cast um, iron uh, fence here, if I put a wooden fence on it and wax that, I think it'll slide much more smoothly for much more longer in between waxings. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and put this on here. Oh, and another thing about putting a really tall fence on here is it probably wouldn't fit my tool chest anymore either. So I'm just gonna put a little short one on there. And I think that'll help me with all the rabbiting I have to do today. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that.
but now I'm on to rabbiting. So uh, these are the uh, panels for my case sides that I need to rabbit. I'm gonna put big rabbits the full length of these boards to uh, make room for a case back to fit into. So got a lot of rabbiting to do. So why don't I show you the knicker on the plane and talk about it a little bit. So here it is right here, this little guy right here. So you'll notice that it's a round blade. It should look a little bit familiar to you if you use wheel gauges, wheel marking gauges. The, in theory, the uh, purpose of this knicker is to sever the fibers before the blade encounters them. So any of the fibers that are adjacent to the rabbit don't get lifted and torn out by the blade as it passes through. This is particularly the case when you're doing end rabbits. So as such, this plane is actually uh, technically what they call a moving philister plane, or if it was like a wooden body plane, that's probably what it would be called. So that's what this is for, is for that end grain, really. But this actually helps with long grain as well. So like with this board here, down here I have fibers that are running into the rabbit kind of against the uh, direction of travel of the uh, blades. So that's as liable to tear out uh, as it would if it were on the end grain as well. So in theory, that's what this knicker is for. In practice, not so much. It's just such a pain in the butt to line up with this blade it's more trouble than it's worth in my opinion so I've kind of given up on using this and what I do instead because this is basically a wheel gauge blade what I do instead of using the one that's on the plane body is use the one that's on my marking gauge I know big revelation right but this basically serves the same purpose so what I'm gonna do is come back to my board here and mark the width of my rabbit with this blade and I've already made a pass or two here I'm just gonna make sure that it's extra deep and this will sever the fibers where the rabbit's gonna go ahead of time. So when the blade passes through here, particularly down here, it's not gonna tear that out. Assuming, and this is important, assuming that I line up the blade such that it's just inside of that knife line. That's a, an important thing to note. And then if I get deeper into my rabbit, if the uh, wall of the rabbit uh, gets a little bit ugly, I can always clean it up later with a simple shoulder plane like this one. Now another thing I'd like to point out is normally when you see rabbiting being done on big boards like this, or panels as the case may be, 
Uh, people will lay it flat on their bench and clamp it down some way, and then they'll run the rabbit plane down the edge of the board like so. And the issue I have with that is uh, as the rabbit gets deeper, there's less and less material here for your fence to ride against, and that's less uh, surface area to reference off of, which means that it's going to be harder to keep your blade square to the cut. You're going to have to be using more body English there than you would otherwise. And so what I do to kind of avoid that scenario is to clamp the board or the panel vertically on the front of my bench instead. So I'm going to flip this all around. I have a dog stop in my sliding dead man down here to kind of support it from underneath. Get it all lined up and clamped here. And I'll put a uh, hold fast in my leg down here to kind of hold this tight. And then what I'm going to be doing is running my rabbit plane this way. And that way it doesn't matter how deep my rabbit gets, I still have the full face of the board to reference off of with the fence of the plane. So that's a better way to do it in my opinion. But that means I've changed the orientation of the cut. So what used to be the width of the rabbit that I marked with the marking gauge here is now going to become the depth. And the reason I like to mark the depth of my rabbits is another feature of this plane that I don't find to be foolproof is the depth stop on here. So you can loosen this little guy, move that up and down, basically set the depth that you're going to be rabbiting at with this guy right here. So I have found it pretty easy to overcome this depth stop no matter how tight I make this knob, which means that I have accidentally made my rabbit too deep. And that is just a disaster in the making. So rather than rely on this, what I do is just watch my progress and when I get down to that marking gauge line, uh, I know I've reached the full depth of my rabbit. So I just have to pay a little more attention. In the end, I probably would have been better served by a regular just wooden bodied rabbit plane that doesn't have any kind of fence or depth stops on it at all. But I do like having these things as kind of a backup uh, for if I have a moment of inattention, it might signal to me, hey, you're nearing the end of this cut here, pay attention. So I do set this depth stop, but I don't really rely on it entirely. Like, in fact, I'll set it so it's a little bit shallower than my rabbit's gonna ultimately be. And that way it kind of signals to me that I'm almost there and I need to start watching my gauge lines. So I'm gonna come back through here with my wheel gauge and mark what is gonna become the width of my rabbit so these fibers don't tear out either and have at it. Okay, so now I'm going to align my blade with the knife line that I created here and I dragged my mechanical pencil down it so you could see it a little bit better. And I also removed the depth stop on the plane so you can see that better as well. And the way I do it is, you know, I loosen up my fence rods like that and just kind of finagle it in and out. Just give it a little wiggle until I'm just inside of my knife line. I don't put it directly on the knife line. I'm not trying to split the knife line. I'm just inside of it. And the reason I do that is in my initial cuts, if I were to accidentally lean this into the uh, wall of the rabbit a little bit, the blade, you'll notice, I don't know if you can see that, but the blade is moving in. It's actually moving across the knife line when I do that. So to give myself a little bit of room to kind of wiggle this a little bit. I like to keep that blade just inside of the knife line. So I'm gonna wiggle it around a little until it's right there, right about there. And then tighten down my fence rods real good. More about fence rods in a moment. But that's gonna be the width of my blade right there. And I'm gonna be kind of cognizant of not tilting the body of the plane into that rabbit. One last thing before I start uh, doing this rabbit is uh, a note about the fence rods. When you're doing a uh, really thick shaving with this skew blade, the skew of the blade is gonna pull the uh, plane body into the rabbit a little bit, into the board. And that puts a lot of pressure on the fence. And so if your fence rods are a little bit too smooth or you accidentally got some oil on them or something like that, they can actually slip. And then uh, you'll notice that you're overcutting your line and creating tear out on the inside of that line. And of course, you're 
widening your rabbit more than you intended when that happens. So it's not good at all if these are slipping. So if you find that uh, something that's happening to you, one of the ways you can uh, improve the situation is A, make sure you don't have any oil on these. Uh, maybe even wipe it with a little bit of degreaser on a rag so it's not all lubed up. And then you can actually come to the body with some sandpaper. This is 220 grit sandpaper. And you basically can just wrap it around the fence rods and score them a little bit like that. This is 220. This is actually pretty aggressive. I think this is just what I kind of had sitting on the bench already. Ordinarily, I think I would recommend something more like a 320 to do this. So I'm going to go ahead and put these rods back on. Now I can actually feel there's a little bit more gription. That's a technical term, folks, gription. And when I tighten these down, they're much more liable to stay where I put them and not slip. So another little tip for kind of tuning up this plane a little bit. All right, let's do some rabbiting. So one of the things that's recommended to do with things like rabbit planes and especially plow planes is to uh, start by making kind of a shortcut and then a little bit longer one and then a little bit longer one and then doing the full length. Uh, the reason being is that once you established a little bit of a cut, uh, the plane will start to follow that as it uh, hits it when you do progressively longer cuts. Now, if your plane has a fence on it like this one does and you've taken precautions to make sure that it doesn't slip like we just did, you don't really have to worry about that. So you can go ahead and do a full length shaving right from the get-go if you're so inclined. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do here. But uh, I just want to make you aware of that. I've tried it both ways, like with a, uh, with a plow plane. I've tried doing the progressively longer uh, passes thing, and I've also just started at the end and taken the full pass. And even with that plane, I find that it doesn't really make much of a difference. That's really for planes that have unreliable fences or no fence at all. So I'm going to come on down here and let it ride. And you'll see another thing I'm doing is I'm kind of keeping my left foot planted down here. That way I take the fewest steps possible when making these passes. Just like that. It's kind of like using a pivot foot in basketball. Not that I'm good at basketball at all. Yeah, I can feel that that auxiliary fence is sliding real smooth on the outside of this. And I'm not going to have to really wax it at all. But if you're so inclined, if you feel like there's a lot of drag in the cut, you can always come through here with some wax. This is just a little block of paraffin I got at the store. I think the brand name was Gulf Wax. And back in the day, you know, this is like adjusted for inflation or whatever. This is a uh, like $7 maybe for like a, a pack of like four of these little paraffin blocks. And it's lasted me my entire career. <laughs> so uh, this, these go a long ways. Nowadays, I think they run more like $12, $13. But still, uh, I think it's good value to do that. So it's just a matter of rinsing and repeating like that until I get down to those depth lines. One thing I notice is that, I don't know, it's kind of a little bit, little bit hard to push and it's not taking a full thickness shaving like I feel it should, which says to me that this blade is dull, quite dull. So I'm going to take this over and sharpen it and uh, show you what equipment I use to sharpen a skew blade like this. All right, now I'm over here where my sharpening station is, and let me just take this lid off here. I've got my skew blade out, and yeah, it's, it's a little dull, kind of dirty, and yeah, definitely could have used some sharpening before I even started. Normally that's what I would do, but I guess I was distracted because I'm filming instead of getting my work done. But anyways, so here's my skew blade, and in my little sharpening kit here, I have an attachment for that. So I use the Veritas Mark II honing jigs, and... Veritas, generally speaking, does a good job of covering all the bases, so they make an attachment for that, which is this guy here. This attachment is specifically for sharpening uh, skew blades. So it just fits in here like this. 
And as far as where to set it up and the little scale they have here for blade width, I like to set it, whoops, all the way around, kind of all the way to this end of the jig. And I'll show you why in a moment. Let's tighten it down just a little bit. All right, so I'll slide my blade in there. So I line it up with this little corner right here. And because I offset the attachment to the left side of the jig, that means that when I tighten it down in the jig, it's tightening more in the center of that clamp. Otherwise, you know, if I center the attachment on the uh, body of the honing guide, then this part of the blade would be way over here on this side of the clamp, and that can cause it to kind of go uneven when you tighten it down, and then you end up skewing your <laughs> sharpening uh, bevel on your skew blade. So that's the way I set it up. And by the way, if you're curious about my whole sharpening setup I have going on here with these steel lapping plates, I did do a video about that. Um, so it's just in my uh, in my channel. You'll be able to see that there. Uh, that's the way to go for me. So, so now you can see I am ready to go to sharpen this skew blade up in my regular honing guide. Now before you put your blade back in, you might want to take a look at the uh, place where the blade beds to the plane and make sure there isn't any, you know, sawdust or anything going on in there. And then hopefully in the process of taking your blade out and putting it back in, you didn't bump these little set screws in here. So you can adjust the angle of the blade uh, to some extent to reference off of with these two little set screws. And when you put your blade back in, they reference right against that, those two screws. I'm trying to be all gentle here. There we go. Apply pressure to the side of the blade, just like this, to kind of hold it in place. And then tighten down the little cap iron that comes with it. You want the cap iron, the bottom of the cap iron, where it meets the blade, to kind of be centered on the blade because if you're not careful, the cap iron can actually project out the side of the plane right here and screw you up. So make sure you're not doing that. Make sure it's nice and centered. Tighten that down. And it should be right back to where you left it before you stop to sharpen. Okay, so let's see if that made any difference. Yeah, it did. Oh, that's nice. And it's kind of fun, the little curly Q shavings that these skew planes make, too. All right. Yeah, looking good. Looking good. One last thing I want to talk about is doing end rabbits with the skew rabbit plane. Everything I've shown you to this point has been on the long grain of boards, but in the case uh, like this piece of scrap here, what if I wanted to put a rabbit on the end grain of something without using the knicker? So... One of the things I would do is put a marking gauge line on there, just like I would with the long grain. Uh, but then I would chisel out a little bit of the waste on the inside of that marking gauge line, and I would actually saw the wall of my rabbit with either a carcass saw or maybe even uh, my shot made stair saw here, which has a, a depth stop kind of built into it. So in uh, sawing out the wall of my rabbit, I don't have to worry about uh, blowing up the end grain on uh, the side of the rabbit here, because if you don't use a knicker when going cross grain with the skew rabbit plane, you are gonna make a horrible mess of that face grain. Ask me how I know. So that's the way I get around that. And yes, that is extra work, but I get much better results that way. I don't have to worry about destroying my work piece, basically. Um, if you had a really wide one to do, say you're doing like a breadboard ends on like a tabletop, and so it's a really long uh, end rabbit, Again, you could use something like a stair saw, or if you have a track saw, you can set the depth on your track saw and cut out the walls of your end rabbits that way as well. Either one works, whatever works for you. Um, but that's the way I get around dealing with uh, this, the knicker on this plane being such a pain in the butt to set up and get right, is just don't use it. Uh, so, and then I just saw the side of my rabbit, uh, my end rabbit, and uh, set the blade such that it's not all the way against the wall of the kerf. That's pretty important too, because the, the blade even touches the inside of that wall, it's gonna blow up this end grain on the side of the line, the keeper part. So 
I'll actually put it so that it's kind of in the middle of the curve. And then it's super easy to plane away that end grain uh, without messing up the wall. And then if that wall needs any cleanup, again, I'll just kind of go at it with a, a shoulder plane to kind of clean it up. So that's how I deal with end grain rabbits with this plane as well. Well, that's it. That's all I can think of to say about the Veritas Q rabbit plane, generally speaking. I think it's a great plane. I've had it for years, done a ton of work with it, and it all turned out fine. That said, there are a few quirks, as I have pointed out, that you may encounter when you use it. And hopefully I've given you some ideas for how to deal with those quirks. So uh, whether you're new to the plane and just learning how to use it, or you're an experienced woodworker who's just watching videos like this, like a fisherman would watch fishing videos, I guess. Uh, hopefully either way you got something out of it. And if you did, and you want to support the channel a little bit better, there are ways you can do that, of course. One of them is the affiliate links I usually leave in the videos for the products that you may have seen in those videos. If you purchase any of those products via the links provided, a little bit of the purchase price goes towards supporting the channel at no extra cost to you. And of course, there's always a little super thanks icon at the bottom of the video where you can just make a straight up donation and you know buy me a burrito or something like that for the trouble. So I appreciate you watching. I'm gonna go do a whole bunch of rabbiting and we'll see you in the next video. Now, if you like what you saw here, please hit like and subscribe. It helped me out a lot. Also hit the little bell icon if you wanna be notified anytime I release a new video. And if you didn't like what you saw here, keep it to yourself, pal or watch one of my other videos. You might like one of those. Thank you for watching.